Okay, we're back. We're live. We're here. It's Monday. It's uh, 12 noon. And that means it's 12 midnight in Europe. So we should do uh, midnight in Europe right now with uh, our correspondent in Europe, Gary Kandekar, who is with Fride, F-R-I-D-E, which is a think tank uh, in Spain and in uh, Belgium. And she joins us uh, by Skype from Brussels, Belgium. Welcome again to the show, Gary. Thank you so much, Dave. It's a pleasure always. Always a pleasure. So uh, we, I'd like to, you know, sort of catch up with you on, uh, especially on Charlie. We missed uh, we missed our schedule the last time, and I, I want to sort of get your, you know, get your thoughts about what happened and and how it has affected Europe and the, the way that people think in Europe. It certainly has revealed issues that uh, people in the U.S. were not generally familiar with about how things work in Europe. So can you sort of start with, um, you know, the demonstrations in Paris uh, that followed the, the, the killings in uh, Charlie Hebdo uh, two weeks ago? Sure. Um, I think the, the Charlie Hebdo killings have, have marked a turning point in Europe. I mean, people's mindsets have uh, really changed overnight, and you could see that even here in Brussels on the street, you can see uh, more security, people, uh, armed police, and really they've even got the military personnel uh, guarding the EU institutions, which are just a short walk away from my house. And that's really something very surprising to see around here, or at least it was. Uh, it, you never saw armed security in Brussels ever. Um, the march has been uh, quite important. Uh, I personally was very scared that it might turn over into uh, uh, little fights, and you know, in 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 the in the in the beaulieu or the um, the suburbs, as they say, uh, against local communities of different uh, religious backgrounds. So, but I think the march has been positive. Uh, France reacted in a very a uh, good way in creating this march of unity um, and around two million people uh, stepped out in Paris and I think around four million in the entire France. You know, I, I, I was listening to an uh, American uh, criminal law professor on Hawaii Public Radio this morning uh, and he made a couple of interesting points which may be worth mentioning at this point in our discussion. Uh, one is that you know, Americans don't realize that the Muslim population in Europe uh, lives in, in ghettos. And they are very tough neighborhoods. They're public housing or slum. Uh, and for one reason or another, probably because the government uh, doesn't do more or also because the Muslims don't you know, get out of those neighborhoods, people are staying very concentrated in those neighborhoods. And those neighborhoods are very unpleasant. They're very... Um, you know, hard to live in, and they're very dangerous. Um, and I recall last time I was in Brussels, it was before your time, um, our, uh, our hotel keeper told us, be very careful where you go, because there are some neighborhoods in Brussels that, you know, you won't come back from. Uh, <laughs> and, and uh, you know, that's pretty rough. Uh, and it sounded from the discussion on NPR that that was rougher even than the toughest slums in the U.S. Uh, or if you're a stranger in those neighborhoods, you're, you're in trouble. The other point he made, which I, which I offer you for discussion, is that where America is a melting pot, and its economy is a melting pot economy, where really everyone, you know, by dint of hard work, by dint of, uh, you know, entrepreneurial determination, uh, has a chance to make a business, has a chance to make a success, um, that's not necessarily the case in Europe. And Europe is more locked into, um, you know, old model, older models, where sometimes, at least for the Muslims, they, they don't have upward mo mobility. And it's not the same kind of economy where they, they have that option. And those young kids in those slums uh, look around for options in their lives, for opportunity to succeed, and they don't see any. And, uh, you know, the unemployment is very high. So they are necessarily driven to jihad as one way to get out of the slum. So can you comment on those, those yeah. remarks that were made? 
Now, whatever you said was all true, with the exception of the fact that the the, the hoods of Brussels where you won't get back, and it's it's much safer than the U.S. I would say because there's no gun culture here. So <laughs> okay. Having lived in the hood myself, next to the main railway station, I I, I think uh, I I'd live to tell this story. Um, yes. Uh, most European governments today acknowledge that they have either failed to integrate these Muslim populations or uh, they're not doing a good job of it. And it's true because the Muslim communities, or most of them, are, uh, are living in areas that are less fortunate, that are less uh, wealthy, um, and their, uh, their culture seems to get stronger as they leave uh, the countries they come from. Uh, most some Muslims here wouldn't even wear the burqas back home, but they do wear it here in Europe. Now, um, in terms of integration, there is this um, kind of uh, racism that is prevalent across Europe, and and most Europeans or the white European community would uh, prefer to give a job to uh, a non. Uh, um, a, a, a non-Muslim, and that is a uh, practice which, which is very hard to change. Now, the social welfare state also has made it somewhat easier uh, for communities to live in the in the circumstances they find themselves in. Uh, I first, I at foremost do not criticize the social Europe model because I really think it's useful. But again, you need equal opportunities. Those who can work hard, regardless of their background should have the opportunity to succeed if they work hard. Uh, education is free in Europe. So I think it's just more in terms of practice. This kind of um, social ex exclusion has given rise to uh, what we see is a lot of frustration amongst the youth uh, in terms that they are not getting the equal opportunities, they are not being treated equally. And there is this anger that is being generated, and it's a chicken and egg scenario. If you're an angry youth, uh, I think it would it makes your chances of getting employed much harder mm -hmm. than than you know being a pleasant person. Um, but that said, uh, Europe, the, Europe's um, Muslim population, of course, is second and third generation by now. But most of it, uh, most of Europe's immigration comes from. Uh, the Middle East uh, and North Africa, which are Europe's neighboring countries. Uh, and these are not some of the most advanced or developed countries. And the, the population, the immigration, immigrant population is mainly asylum seekers. Mm -hmm. And if you bring these communities from the most rural areas of the world to the most advanced areas of the world, the most liberal areas, you're going to get an eventual clash, a clash of cultures, I would say. Mm -hmm. And adapting to this kind of different culture is difficult, um, but it does take some some time, I think. And this is one of the main problems that we see across Europe, where there's a huge discontent uh, uh, against uh, immigration or rather asylum uh, seekers, and uh, this has been one of the main agenda items of the anti-Islamic movements uh, in, in Germany, but across Europe now, and even in Greece, which we'll come to later. Ah, how interesting. Well, you know, uh, it's a disconnect for me in the sense that um, uh, I, I, I remember the French were, were uh, saying to the uh, Muslim students, don't wear burqas to school. Look like everyone else. Dr dr you know, dress, dress with, the, um, with, with, you know, with everyone else. And they, there was a fight over that. And they say, why, why fight over it? Integration is a good thing. I mean, in the U.S., part of the melting pot is that everybody, you know, they may retain their cultural identity, but they don't go out of their way to look different. Uh, they go out of their way after a generation or two. They go out of their way to, to try to, you know, assimilate. Uh, and this happened to generation after generation, dozens and dozens of generations of, of um, immigrants. Um, but that, that doesn't seem to be the case in Europe. And uh, so you make your own bed if you do that. I mean, if you walk in for a job wearing a burqa in Paris, it's not likely you're going to get, not nearly as likely you're going to get the job as if you walked in wearing French clothes. Um, so, you know, what is holding that back? I mean, is it a cultural thing 
a religious thing or just a stiff neck kind of resistance to French culture? Well, the thing is that, I mean, for example, the U.S. is an immigrant country. It is formed by, uh, from its main ethos, it's, it's formed by people of different origins, people of different culture. As you say, it's a melting pot. So is India. India has been a very welcoming country. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Indian. Um, and it, it, it's a country which has received people of every religion and every background. Uh, but Europe, in contrast, has, is, has not been an, uh, an immigrant recipient country until now. So European culture is very strong here. And to have something different comes as a threat. It's perceived as a threat to the European way of life, to European culture, to European values. If you walk in a burqa in India, you won't, you won't appear out of the normal, you know? Mm -hmm. But here, it does strike out because they're different from everyone else and completely different. And the attitudes change here, even my attitude. I look at a burqa here, but I wouldn't turn my eyes around for one in India. I think it's, it's all about um, the, the identity, this European identity. So, but then also in France, you have this very strong culture of laicity uh, or separation, separation of religion uh, from state. Mm -hmm. And that's why they banned the burqa, of course, uh, uh, but also any uh, religious symbols, and be it the cross, be it the Muslim symbols or uh, the Jewish symbol, any, any religious symbols, they banned the people from wearing them prominently. So I, I think that also how is how is the uh, how is the reaction to how aside from the uh, demonstrations in Paris uh, how how has the reaction to the Charlie Hebdo uh, incident been around Europe uh, yeah. have there been sympathetic reactions uh, in the same way as the as there was in Paris very interesting question uh, and I was dying to come to it earlier. Now, uh, on, the, on the day of the march and the Paris reactions, everybody called themselves Charlie, Je suis Charlie. But the day after, there were a lot of people who were saying, I'm not Charlie, because I don't believe in insulting any religion. Most of the Muslims said that. And then you have this kind of debate on, am I Charlie or am I not? And I think that is a healthy debate in particular because it really kind of puts the debate, the discussion or the topic of does religion, uh, uh, is, is religion something that should be respected enough to, you know, stay out of its boundaries or can we talk freely about anything and if we talk about anything, means literally anything including people could talk about the Holocaust or not, you know, yeah. that is also freedom of expression then. Yeah. So that has been one thing. The second uh, issue has been the heightened security. Just a few days before here in Brussels, the terror threat level was the highest ever. Uh, and this is because um, the, the police and the armed uh, service personnel, they went and um, killed uh, two, uh, two terrorists uh, just outside of Brussels in a town called Verbier. So that is very surprising, and, and, and there have been a number of arrests as well. And this is around all European capitals. In Germany, what happened was there have been many uh, anti-Muslim uh, anti marches, and this was led by uh, a political uh, group called Pegida, uh, mainly in Dusseldorf. But across Germany, and hundreds of thousands of people have taken part in this. And across Europe, across Europe, you really see this battle of um, anti-Islam, no, is, uh, jihad is not Islam, the terrorists are not Islam, freedom of speech or, or religious uh, respect. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's quite uh, high up there, you know. Everybody's talking about it. You know, one thing, you mentioned France. <coughs> we, we hear about Germany. But what about Eastern Europe? Does the same, yeah. where, where's the boundary for this uh, kind of contention uh, lie? I mean, uh, if I go east of Germany, for example, to Poland, um, do we have the same issue there? Well, it depends. 
Because he's from Poland is also Bulgarian. They also have their Islam issues, but because you know the Turkish uh, or origin population there. But I think most of Eastern Europe is still battling with Russia. This Russian uh, bear that is looking over them, and and uh, the Ukraine battle actually, which has still intensified just recently, has become the worst ever uh, in terms of violence. Uh, so Eastern Europe looks at its own borders and there they can see a really big Russia, which is still in the mindset of the people. Uh, ah, let's here. take a short break, uh, Gary, and I want to sure. come back to Ukraine. Uh, there are so many other fish to fry in Europe these days. Uh, <laughs> that's Gary <laughs> Kandigar of Free Day, which is a think tank in Madrid and in uh, Brussels. And, um, and uh, Gary Kandigar, our, our regular correspondent, is a researcher for Free Day. Uh, here on Think Tech Global, it's uh, midnight in Europe, um, and we're talking about Europe reacts to Charlie and so many other things. We'll be right back with Gauri Kandakar. Aloha, I'm Kili'i Akina, president of the Grassroot Institute and host on Ehana Kako, a weekly program on the Think Tech Hawaii broadcast network. Ehana Kako means let's work together. Think of the sad alternative, let's not work together. Here in Hawaii, with all of our diversity and the richness of the people, it's important for us to come together around issues on the, the basis of what's right, and what's good, and what's going to serve the common good. And that's what we try to do at Ehana Kako. Every week, we interview movers and shakers, people in government, business, and other sectors of society to talk about how to create together a better government, economy, a better world here in Hawaii that can bless the rest of the world. I thank you for your attention to Think Tech Hawaii, and we look forward to seeing you every Monday, 2 to 3 p.m., on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. We're Ehana Kako, and we wish you well. Aloha. Okay, we're back. We're live. We're here with Gary Kandakar of Free Day, a European think tank, who joins us to talk about uh, how Europe is reacting to Charlie Hebdo. Uh, before we get uh, into Ukraine, which I do want to do, um, I just wanted to ask you one other question. You know, so you have you have the Charlie incident, you have the French reaction, um, and the reaction of other places, uh, you know, uh, in in Europe, especially Western Europe. But um, what about the m Muslim reaction to the reaction? I mean, do you see, for example, Muslims speaking out and saying, wait, you're treating us unfairly. We didn't really do this. Islam doesn't really believe in violence. Do you, do you see that happening too? Yes, actually most uh, Muslims are kind of saying that why should they be put in a corner and have to forcibly denounce uh, all these terror attacks that are taking, saying that this is not Islam, this is not us and not in my name, you know, this hashtag that got very famous. So I think most Muslims feel, or the, the normal ones, you know, that go about their work, they, say, they think it's not related to them, but still they are being kind of pushed into a corner to stand up and say that, no, this person is not Muslim and this is not Islam. So I think that's, that's the main thing that's going around. Also, of course, they, they still don't agree with publishing um, uh, cartoons or any depictions of Prophet Muhammad. And, and it's understandable because it's sacred to them. So well, you know, that's, that's an interesting point because in the US, in UK, in France, Germany, I expect, maybe other countries in Western Europe, there is real freedom of speech. I mean, we, we in America, we think we invented it, uh, but it isn't, it isn't really so. Uh, we, we don't have any, any, any corner on that and that Western Europe uh, really sincerely believes in the most absolute way of freedom of speech. So it would be, um, uh, it would be uh, sort of shocking uh, for a, a Western European or an American uh, to feel that uh, the depiction of Muhammad, uh, you know, is, 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 um, is, is worthy of violence. Uh, yeah. how, I mean, I mean, there seems to be a clash of civilizations on this. How is this going to work out? Well, you see, Jay, the problem here is that Western Europe is, is really advanced in its mindset. They're, 
they've, they've transcended kind of these uh, normal development, you know, where, where most of the world seems to be at. Most of the communities here are very atheist and they don't believe in this God culture or, you know, this religious system. However, uh, the rest of the world doesn't. And when you make, uh, when you have satire about issues, they're not about issues that, that stay within the country's borders or within the EU's borders. They affect religions that are outside. And most people outside still, uh, still care about these issues very deeply. So I think this should be kind of a, a balance because everybody's not at the same level, you know. Everybody's not at, doesn't have the same uh, understanding uh, that you might have. Um, I really don't care personally. <laughs> But I think uh, there, there is a certain kind of uh, nuance that should go into, you know, when things start to affect um, people outside your own borders. Yeah. I think that should be a... Uh, yeah. Okay, well, let me, let me switch over to a comment that you made before the break, and that is about how people, at least in Eastern Europe, are distracted by what's going on with, uh, you know, the uh, Ukraine. And, and Russian provocations uh, in Ukraine. And it seems clear from the news uh, that, that, these, um, that these fighters, uh, anti-Ukraine government fighters, are actually being uh, encouraged and supported and supplied by Russia. Uh, it's another you know, Russian technique for undoing any kind of uh, stability in the Ukraine. Uh, why, why do the Russians continue to do that? They, they risk new sanctions, they risk a, a devolution of their economic, uh, their former economic success. Um, why do they keep on doing it when, when it's obvious what they're doing? No one really believes that they're not fomenting all this unrest in Ukraine. Well, I think it's become a matter of uh, pride now for uh, Putin. And it's become an ego game now. It's gone beyond... Uh, uh, controllable limits, I think, and, and you know, there's no coming back now because there are sanctions in place. Okay, if it gets tougher, it does not affect Putin, but if he loses the, the little uh, battle uh, over Ukraine, I would say, because you know, you have uh, many more, the Moldo, uh, Belarus. <laughs> so if he loses the little battle, he loses his pride and his place amongst uh, his people. He does not at all at any cost want to appear weak. And for Russia, even though uh, the, the oil prices have fallen currently, uh, it's still a tap that's going to open. And they can let it uh, run for whenever, you know, until, uh, until really the last drop. So I think uh, for Putin now, uh, it's more about uh, pride. But yeah. on the other hand, what can uh, European governments do beyond sanctions, you know? Putin knows that very well. There's not going to be a war. Uh, there's no, NATO is not going to attack Russia at any cost. And there's the Middle East again to preoccupy the, the Americans. So, well, Putin has his way clear. He's going to, he's going to tank Ukraine. It, you know, this, at this, 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 there's only one hand clapping, really. And uh, soon enough, I think he'll have his way. But this is really a test of, of Russia, the test of whether his pride and, and his um, macho approach to things will prevail, even against better, better judgment by some people in, the Russian, in Russia. Uh, I, I read that uh, there are organizations, there are protests in Russia against what Putin is doing. Do you think they have any chance of succeeding in Russia? Uh, no, not at all. I mean, the leader who was opposing, uh, I, I, the name runs away from my, my thoughts, but uh, he was jailed. He was put under house arrest. Uh, and I don't think uh, that any of these protests uh, w would have any effect on, uh, on what's happening in Ukraine. What, um, what Putin is doing now in Ukraine is basically punishing them for having having uh, gone against uh, his, uh, his original plans and ideas and, you know, looked more westwards towards the EU. 
So it's more a punishment. I, I don't think uh, Russia will assimilate any more territory of Ukraine. He just wants to break it up. It's just a, a redrawing of borders mm -hmm. and a, a kind of continued unrest that will probably remain for, you know, a couple of years or so more. Uh, but it's just his, his now it's a, it's a punishment and Putin really is trying to give a message to Europe that these were my geopolitical boundaries and you should have stayed away, you know. Mm -hmm. I don't want NATO on my border. Well, well, you know, at the same time, uh, you know, I'm assuming that he will have his way. Um, this is going to do damage both uh, politically uh, and economically to both Russia and, and Europe. Uh, how do you think that's going to play out? Will this all, you know, resolve itself and go back to normalcy, or is there a, a permanent um, change in the, uh, the diplomatic and economic relations between Russia and Western Europe? I doubt it, you know, because uh, honestly, I think that European interests in Russia are quite great. Uh, Europe is not going to change. Uh, it's oil and gas suppliers overnight. It can, just cannot do that. And instability in the Middle East means that it is even more dependent on Russia. Uh, and most countries are phasing out their nuclear uh, energy dependence, uh, especially Germany. So I think in this case, Russia is, uh, is the only viable option. Um, that said, uh, you know, Sergei Lavrov, uh, the foreign minister, uh, was at the Paris march, uh, and he stood beside uh, François Hollande of France, you know. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, um, there is a certain uh, malaise uh, in terms of Ukraine. Of course, it goes beyond malaise. But given the economic downturn in Europe, uh, the weak euro, uh, the, the fragile economy, I don't think uh, the EU itself can afford to really indulge in a war of sanctions over Russia, uh, over a, a country like Ukraine that is really very limited, uh, uh, of very limited interest to, up into European interests, I think. Yeah. Well, let's, let's turn a little bit to the, 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 uh, the general economic malaise in Europe and yeah. turn to, uh, to Greece uh, with the, um, the success, the uh, you know, the recent election in, in Greece with Alexis uh, Tsipras um, saying that he wanted to renegotiate the deal with Germany and Germany essentially saying that well they, they agreed to give 11 billion dollars in the next uh, tranche of money but only only if um, Greece uh, you know uh, uh, used the, or followed the rules of the agreement made earlier in terms of being more disciplined about its fiscal policy. Uh, what's going to happen with that? It seems like the parties are taking hardline positions. Will there be negotiations, or will Greece leave uh, Western Europe? You know, it's something that nobody knows at the moment. Honestly, I mean, Alexis Tsipras, uh, the leader of uh, this, the far left Syriza party, um, has uh, has won this election where. <laughs> Uh, I mean, it was not a surprise, but you know, it was something that was dreaded. And he's completely, completely uh, anti bailout. He he does not want austerity. Sorry, he's completely anti austerity measures. Uh, he wants to relaunch the Greek economy, but I don't think he has a concrete plan. You know, he, how are you going to relaunch an economy without reform? Yeah. And well, this is what uh, most. Uh, European countries are worried about. Well, it seems like it's, re it's really, um, you know, unrealistic. Because, uh, you know, if you, he's responding to the, the kids in the street who don't like austerity because austerity is painful for them in their daily lives. But if, if as a matter of fact, as a matter of logic, as a matter of economics, the only way to re for Greece to recover is through austerity. And I'm not sure that's entirely true, but assuming that, that the only way they can recover is by austerity, then, then uh, he's digging a grave, he's digging a hole uh, for the very people that elected him. Uh, and it, it sounds to me from the outside that it's slightly irresponsible. Yeah, completely. Well, 
Alexis Tsipras is now 40. So in 2008, he was one of the youngsters running around, you know? Mm -hmm. And he just came to power. Um, I think this is a false promise because one, uh, Greece debt is 175% of his GDP, which is enormous, you know? Uh, the sector does need reform. I mean, Greek would not have had these problems if its e economy, the structure, the basic fundamental structure of its economy and its social system was not flawed. So this does need to change. Um, there, there have been instances where uh, there are countries, uh, especially in, uh, in Southeast Asia, have rejected, for example, the IMF austerity packages. Uh, and they did survive. Uh, they did get out of the, the, their own crisis, the Asian financial crisis of 97. But the problem with Greece is that uh, it's really entangled uh, with the EU, the European economy, and the Eurozone. Now, uh, even if it uh, leaves the Euro, which I probably think it will, even to stay in the, in the EU itself, uh, there are some conditions of, um, of their economic uh, uh, stability, and now growingly fiscal policies as well, because Europe is slowly becoming a fiscal union, which means that uh, tax policies across the EU are going to be more synchronized. So, I, 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 I mean, there's a 50-50 chance, yeah, but I don't think that Alexis Tsipras really has a plan, and next tomorrow morning, when he really gets to office and sees the papers, uh, not the newspapers, but you know, all the financial papers, and then thinks of a plan and he's blank, then I think he's going to have to backtrack on his promises. Yeah, and, then, and, and even more so when he sees uh, this discussion here on Think Tank at uh, midnight in <laughs> Europe. When he sees yes. this, he'll reconsider his position, I'm sure. <laughs> Let's take a short break, Gary. <laughs> this is Gary Kandakar of Free Day, which is a European think tank. In, Madrid and uh, Brussels. Uh, here we are on uh, midnight in Europe because it is midnight in Europe and we're talking about Europe reacts to Charlie and more. Uh, I'm Jay Fidel. I really enjoyed this discussion. We'll be right back. <laughs> Aloha. Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii. My name is Josh Green. I'm the host of a program called Healthcare in Hawaii. I'm a physician. I work in the emergency department on the Big Island. I also serve in the State Senate, which please don't hold that against me, doesn't detract from my television program. We speak about all the big health care issues in the state. We get together on Tuesdays from 2 o'clock till 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And we try to talk about the most important issues in health care. This is a terrific venue for people to learn about health care. There are many programs on this, on this station. We broadcast it later, uh, not just on the Internet, but also on OC16. Thanks for joining us. Please be informed health care consumers. Okay, we're back. We're live. We're here with uh, Gauri Kandakar, who joins us by Skype from Brussels. She's with Fride, F-R-I-D-E, European think tank there, and she helps us understand what's going on in Europe. And over time, we will have an education of it, Gauri, so we have to keep on doing this for the benefit of the public here in Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> You're too kind. <laughs> so Thanks anyway, so we, we, we've talked about uh, Charlie Hebdo. Uh, we've talked about the reaction to that. We've talked about uh, Eastern Europe and Ukraine. We've talked about Greece. But we need to talk about, especially given uh, your relationship with India, because you're Indian and you visit there all the time, um, we, have to, we have to talk about uh, President Barack Obama's most recent trip. In fact, he may still be there uh, meeting with uh, uh, Narendra Modi in India. What's the status of that visit? They're still there, Michelle, both Michelle and Barack Obama, and India, I tell you, Jay, is on a new high. Indians are so happy, so happy that Barack Obama has graced uh, the Republic Day celebrations in New Delhi. Uh, and this is the first time that a U.S. president has ever done so. He's been a chief guest at our Republic Day parade. And it has brought about a new step in the relationship uh, in Indo-US ties and they're on a completely new high and, and India with you know this newfound friendship is trying to enter a league of great powers and, and, and be a real counterbalance to China. I think it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful uh, development and as everybody's calling it the 
Mobama romance. <laughs> <laughs> Mobama. <laughs> well, you know, it does accentuate, and every time you read an article about it, you you are reminded that India is uh, the, the world's biggest democracy in sheer numbers. Uh, and uh, and uh, for that reason, the U.S. has a, um, you know, a, a sort of philosophical, uh, a philosophical connection with India. And the two largest pure democracies in the world. And that really is saying something. How, how would you say India's democracy is doing these days? Those elections uh, earlier this year, they were quite something. Modi's success is quite something. Um, how, how, how is it going? I mean, we have trouble here in Congress, as you know. And we, we are not necessarily out for the common good. Uh, we are you know, becoming more difficult in, in terms of our efforts to reach, uh, to reach consensus in Congress. How, how are things going in India? You know, I, I also observe uh, U.S. politics, and I, I really see John Stewart show very often. <laughs> and I can see that Barack Obama had so much trouble, you know, in Congress and his State of the Union speech where the Republicans wouldn't even applaud to good news. You know, the economy is on a high. They wouldn't even applaud. In contrast, Modi is a very strong leader, you know. I think these elections were a blessing for India. And I never say this about any political leaders, but Modi is a blessing for India because he is cutting red tape, he is making corruption less prevalent, he is really putting India on a path to growth. Foreign policy is doing wonderful. I mean, he is really a modern leader, you know, and India needed a modern leader. He just said recently that. Um, People should remove this uh, old age thinking about not wanting a girl child. I mean, this is a nice leader, you know, it's a modern, forward-looking leader, and, and it's so good. Everybody in India is much happier, the economy is happy, uh, people in general seem much happier. Does that, does that include the people who were against him in the election? Oh my God, yes, definitely. And you know why I say this? Because some... Uh, ex-ministers of the Congress government have been chided by their party leadership for being too positive about Modi. <laughs> for example, Minister Shashi Tharoor, he was a minister in the previous government and he's been uh, congratulating Modi for various initiatives like the Clean India Initiative. And there was, there was so many people inside the Congress party that had publicly denounced him that this state that this is not acceptable behavior. Mm, that's great. <laughs> I really think, yeah, yeah. Well, I think, you know, inherent in democracy is when we elect a leader, that the minority goes along with the majority, and we all agree that we had a vote and he's the leader. Uh, yeah. And then we respect him, then we give him a break, and we let him at least have a honeymoon and maybe more so he can do his job throughout whatever his period of, of, of office is. And, and I think uh, it sounds to me from what you say that India is doing that. Uh, they elected uh, Modi, so M Modi's the man for a while, uh, and they'll give him a break. In, uh, in the U.S., it doesn't seem like that anymore. We seem to have lost touch with that idea. Uh, you vote against someone, and then you keep on campaigning against him, and you, know, you, you make trouble for him every time you get a chance, and you, you want to neutralize his efforts and wait for somebody else who you like better. Um, as a result, you can't get anything done. I mean, do you see, how do you feel about that question, the comparison? It's right. It does happen in India as well, you know, very often. I mean, I remember the U.S. Uh, elections, the most recent ones, where the main campaign was one-term president, and that was, you know, <laughs> very shocking for me. But, but Indian politicians face this too. The only difference is now, that the Indian people have overwhelmingly voted for the BJP, the Bharatiya Janata Party, which is Modi's party. And he has an uh, uh, absolute majority in the lower house, yeah? So he, he really has an easier task of going about it. But really, it's also the psychology of Indians. Uh, we, we have fatigue, you know, political leader fatigue. And we really did not expect much from any leader up till now. <laughs> Because they've all disappointed us. <laughs> now, we know how that works. <laughs> now we're pleasantly surprised, I must say. <laughs> so why why is uh, Barack Obama so? This is his what second trip to India. 
uh, and he's clearly showing showing favor now uh, to Narendra Modi, uh, and he's uh, you know he's, he's forging a new and and a closer relationship with India. Why is he doing that? Does it have something to do with American interests in in uh, in uh, you know uh, in in West Asia, um, you know nor northwest of India, and and has something to do with problems in Pakistan and Afghanistan and and so forth. Is that why uh, you think he's, he's uh, getting closer to India? No, I mean, uh, of course, Pakistan is a major issue. Northwest India is a major issue. But for me, the key uh, issue is the one, the U.S. pivot to in, uh, Asia. And a U.S. pivot to Asia will not be sustained without a strong India. Second is democracy. India is the largest democracy in the world and also in the region. So it's a counterbalance to China, of course, not only because of the working communist model uh, that China uh, portrays, or rather a working authoritarian model, but India's democracy works. And an, a working Indian democracy is an inspiration to the rest of Asian countries who would rather prefer to have a democracy. <coughs> Well, let's let's uh, look, look at India as a you know a huge country <laughs> with a strong democratic uh, a strong democratic uh, 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 model, and it's got on the one as you mentioned on the one side it's got China which is you know not democratic, and on the other side it's got Pakistan which which has at well, the, the, the minimum security problems. Um, how how can India handle those things? Is uh, India well well able to deal with those things? Or are those things challenges for India going forward? Well, India's biggest security uh, is its northern and east uh, western neighborhood, meaning China and Pakistan. Uh, India is the world's top uh, military enforcer. Uh, and I think this is saying a lot, yeah? I mean, it's, it's a highly militarized region, the whole Himalayan border. Mm -hmm. uh, Two thirds of Indian India's military base is uh, Pakistan. So these are major threats, and, and these are Indian preoccupations, the security preoccupations. Um, but that said, India has a very different relationship with China because it's also a positive relationship in terms of economic uh, give and take. Uh, economic interlinkages and dependencies are high. Uh, China is also a, a, a supporter of India in the BRICS grouping. Uh, and, and I think uh, internationally, at the multilateral uh, level, um, through the G77, with similar positions on uh, the non-aligned movement or on Syria or Iran, I think China and India share similarities. It's just this security issue that comes in the way. But China and uh, Pakistan are very different uh, uh, neighbors to India. I oh, think. yes. Well, I mean, uh, would you have any concern about what happened in Mumbai? Could that happen again? Uh, is how is how do you see India as a place that is secure against terrorist attacks? Uh, it is quite secure uh, in terms because our uh, intelligence agencies uh, are are they have tons of experience, decades of experience. Uh, border security forces have been strengthened after the Mumbai attacks. Uh, but I also think the partnership with the U.S. is quite strong in terms of um, uh, intelligence. Uh, and here in, in counterterrorism, in cyber warfare, in basic even uh, arms trade, I think the U.S. is a key partner. And this is why India also wants a better relationship with the U.S. because it does see it as an ally, you know? Yes. And, it, and, and the U.S. understands India's problem. Yes, yes, and a worthy ally, a trusted ally. Uh, and indeed, I mean, there's been discussion in the press about how the w one way to deal with Charlie Hebdo uh, is to have intelligence agencies from various countries uh, more readily sharing information on, on terrorist organizations. And that, interestingly enough, would, would include um, India. Uh, furthermore, it seems to me, and I'd like your comment as a closing comment on this, is that when Barack Obama uh, takes initiatives like this and spends three days in India and two hours watching a parade, which is something, uh, you know, on the, on the security issue, 
Um, yeah. What he's really doing is creating new foreign policy that will probably uh, continue beyond his term of office. Um, that there will be momentum in what he does. And in forging a better relationship, a more robust, uh, closer relationship with India now, he's actually, he's actually creating that relationship for the years to come following his term of office. Uh, yeah. what, what, what comment would you have on that? I would just say that Barack Obama has been an undervalued president. And he is really setting the ground for a very dynamic future U.S.-India relationship. Thank you, Gauri, Kand Gauri Kand Kandakar of Free Day, which is a think tank in uh, Madrid and uh, Brussels. And we join, we, she joins us by uh, Skype uh, very nicely. We're getting better at our Skype to uh, Brussels uh, in a discussion of European reaction to Charlie Hebdo and other, other things around the world. We always enjoy talking with her. So, so, uh, thank you so much, Gauri. Thank you so much, Jay. Thank you. We'll set this up again in a couple of weeks, if that's OK with you. Yeah. With pleasure. Gauri Kandakar from Preeti, thank you so much. Aloha, and we'll talk soon. Thank you.